Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Room 42. I'm Liz Fraley from Single Sourcing Solutions. I'm your moderator. This is Janice Summers, our interviewer, and welcome to Jack Labriola, today's guest in Room 42. Jack is an assistant professor of technical communication at Kennesaw State University. He teaches usability testing, information architecture, and the senior capstone design course. He's researched, written, and presented a variety of topics, ranging from the co-edited collection, content strategy, and technical communication, to articles on minimalist design aesthetics, mobile user experience, conference papers on university partnerships, and building student research toolkits. Jack's professional mission is to continue to discover opportunities to research and create better experiences for users in their day-to-day use of technology. And I love this part. In his own words, he works to the benefit of users of all technology, documents, and products to create better experiences while interacting with them. Today, Jack's here to help us start answering the question, how do we help colleagues in different disciplines see the importance of technical communication and user experience? Welcome. Thanks for Hi. having me. That was an incredible introduction, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> I love that phrase. You sent that to me, and I and or it's on your it's on your website, I think your mm-hmm. your, your own yeah. website. I love that phrase because that really brings it all together. Absolutely, absolutely. We have to attack it from all angles, and we have to be really invested with our users and what they're doing. And it's not just the. <laughs> It's not just the thing, right? It is the documents. I find myself more and more looking at when I have to try something out or I'm thinking of buying something that's I know going to be, I don't quite get and I don't know how to use it to its best. I'll read their docs before I even start, before I purchase sometimes. You know, what does that look like? Absolutely. How can I get started in the most effective and efficient way? I might have to just read your documentation and I hope it can help me. (laughs) You know, and the other interesting thing is the documentation also shows, do you care? Sure. Right. You know, there's, there's that aspect too, when you're trying to compare two things and it's like, well, who, whose documentation shows that they really care? Like who's taken the effort to understand me as a user rather than, you know, just trying to sell me on something. Right. Hey, we we know we had to throw in the information booklet. So eh, here you go. Right. Versus we want to help onboard you into this experience, into our product. Let's, let's do this together. I'm going to hold your hand and walk you through it. Yeah. Right, yeah, right. 12 pages of fact questions. That'll do, right? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, oh. that was one thing I saw recently. Oh, no. Oh, don't get me started on FAQ pages. <laughs> anyway. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about, what we're here to discuss is like, how do we break out of our comfort zone and really cross the bridge into areas and disciplines that we don't normally have exposure to? Like, how do we start doing that? Like, this is a complex thing. It's not that simple because we're talking about a group of introverts. <laughs> yeah, I will. I'll push back on that a little bit because sometimes I think it is easy or easier, I think, mm-hmm. than you may think it is because I, I do think there's some intimidation there sometimes. Right. Um, but it is about breaking out of your comfort zone because there's so much that people from other disciplines can offer your research or your area, as well as you being able to offer them something. Right. Um, and so sort of the, the biggest example um, where it sort of happened to me, where I was the one on the outside was my first year here. Um, you know, I, I set up my little faculty web page with my, my research areas and interests and things like that. And there was a, a professor in psychology who was doing some work, um, never really heard of like user experience or usability before, uh-huh. um, but it kept popping up in like the literature that he was reading for his lit review. And he was like, I wonder if there's somebody here at KSU that does this. And kudos to him. He said, I'm going to go look. And he just put in a Google search on the faculty webpage. And then there comes Jack Labriola to the top. Good job on your SEO and your keywords. (laughs) Absolutely. absolutely. First webpage, first link to pop up. But he just, he found me. He found my Mm -hmm. faculty email and he said, I just want to introduce myself. I'm actually on your campus today. 
could I stop by your office? And this was a stranger, a person, like, I don't know anybody. It's my first year here. Uh, and sure enough, the psychology professor just walks up to my door, knocks my door, introduces himself. We get to talk and it's like an hour later. And he's like, I think this would be a really great partnership because I didn't know what user experience was, but it kept popping up and here you are. You just sort of like, <laughs> you know, you, you just happen to be here and we've been working on things together now for the last two years. So mm -hmm. it could be as, just as easy as just sending that first email. Right. Which school of psychology is he in? So he does a lot of cognitive psychology. Okay. Yeah. A lot of mental workload stuff. Um, and so he was coming to me about this project that he sort of already started. Um, uh -huh. He wanted to test the design of different uh, keyboards, like computer keyboards. Um, and so he started reading a little bit on like minimalist and aesthetic design. And like this guy, Jacob Nielsen kept popping up with these usability heuristics. And he's like, is this something that you know? And I was like, say no more. This is what I teach in my usability classes all the time. And he was like, oh my gosh, this is the perfect collaborator here. Um, so I, I, I do think that it can be as simple as that. But there's also sort of this, this feeling, I think, sometime where we have to make that argument for ourselves as to what we can sort of bring to the table. And maybe talking to someone in psychology, talking to somebody in engineering or, or in the hard sciences, you know, something like that is a little tougher to be like, I don't know if I really fit in here or if they're going to maybe push back on what I do because it's different from what they know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I sometimes think that's the barrier that stops a lot of us from maybe reaching out and starting that conversation. Well, you know, and it's interesting. So I kind of have like a couple, a question, and then it's kind of like relates to that. So you you mentioned minimalism, right? And we talk about minimalism a lot. I'm like keen on minimalism. Now, <laughs> other people are talking about minimalism. And are they talking about it in the same way that we think about it, but they're not communicating it the same way? So the way that he was approaching it and the way that he was reading about it in psychology was all about mental workload. And, yeah. and if we're asking our users to maybe accomplish a task using a keyboard that realistically, they only need to click five or six buttons. Right. But they have the entire, you know, and I can sort of use it as a prop here, right? They have the entire keyboard here. They only need five of these keys. And if we ask them and we're trying to maybe see how fast they can recognize something and click the appropriate button, uh -huh. they start to slow down a little bit because there's just, even though it's only five buttons and they know it's only the A, S, D, F key, it's still, it's just a little tough because there's just so many things their fingers could possibly be touching. And right. so the study that he was focusing on was, well, what if we took away the traditional keyboard and I gave you a keyboard that only did have five buttons? How fast and efficient could I make your tasks? And it just starts to be this, okay, how can we remove some of the fluff in terms of whatever product that they're using? And I'm thinking the whole time, I'm really curious, why was this keyboard designed in such a way? Why these five buttons? Why were they designed this big or this color or with this material? But that's not what he's thinking about. He's thinking all about Hmm. How can we just like remove buttons just to make things more simple? Mm -hmm. He's not thinking about what those buttons should look like or how it would really help the user in terms of the design. It's just more about efficiency and how fast can I like let them do this, this project or this work. And you bring up a really interesting point it, 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 because from somebody else's perspective, they're not thinking about those little tiny details, right? from yeah. different schools of thought. And, and I think that's one of the things, I think we talked about this before, is that sometimes people don't know what a professional or technical writer does. Yep, yeah. They don't, they don't understand it. So it's kind of like you, you need to communicate to them in a language that they understand. Because as communicators, this, this is something we should have pretty good practice in. 
right? <laughs> but we forget. Yeah. We forget. And that's <laughs> normal. It's like, you know, psychologists think everybody speaks psychology, mm-hmm. right? Engineers think everybody speaks engineering and they get into a specific language and they think everybody understands that, right? So we all get into that. So I think one of the things, one of the other strategies when you're trying to um, collaborate or break into groups that you're not normally in is how do they speak? It's like a foreign language. Learn that language a little bit and then communicate it back to them. They're like, oh, you help with that stuff. Absolutely. And, from, and, and, the, from the sorry. psychologist's point of view, wasn't he like thrilled? Like, oh my gosh, I never thought of that. Yeah, because we start we start to realize as I start to bring up my background and I'm like, well, here's how I would approach that study or I would approach that design. He's sort of like sitting there and he's like, this kind of sounds like human factors research. And I was like, yes, absolutely. I was like, okay, here's my in, here's my common ground. Yes. Because absolutely, there's so much usability in UX research on the psychology side yes. that they're doing such similar work, but they're calling it something just slightly different. But yeah. I've done I've done research, I've done literature reviews where I've gone and read things from, you know, the Journal of Applied Ergonomics or the Human Factors and Ergonomics Conference. And so I started to have some of that shared lingo because it was really relevant to my own research. And so I said, okay, here's my in. And we just start talking and he's sitting there and he's like, his mind is just being blown. Cause he's like, I've been doing UX research, but I never knew I was doing it. And they wouldn't call it that. And they wouldn't call it that. No, and so, absolutely not. And so he starts to think all of a sudden, wow, there's so much literature and research out there that could have maybe helped me or influenced my, my work that I just wasn't even aware existed. Yeah. Yeah. And so even just having that conversation to be like, hey, let me explain a little bit about what you do. And then all of a sudden it starts to click and you're like, I do kind of know what you're talking about. I can see where you're going to be a super valuable, valuable asset to this project. Right, right. And it's finding those crossroads is because we had a conversation with another professor and uh, you know, it's just interesting. I like the way they phrase things because where technical and professional communication sits is literally at the crossroads of just about every discipline out there. Absolutely. In every profession. So I think that's one of the challenges because sometimes when, when people are stuck in that profession, like when you think about like the medical field, they're stuck in that profession. You kind of want them stuck on that track, <laughs> right? <laughs> you kind of want them to be, but a good technical and professional communicator can understand or, or takes the time to understand their lingo, but understands users. Like that's our emphasis is on user focus so that they can bring that technology to people. And I think that's another unique thing. And I don't think that the doctors understand that when they're no. on the medical track. And, and I think that's why technical writers and technical communicators will always have you know, you want to want to use your terminology, a spot at the table, right? I mean, they're always going to be needed because someone needs to bridge that gap between, you know, the jargon that the doctor or the engineer or the psychologist right. is using versus who their audience is or who their target users are. And mm-hmm. how do we make sense of all of that? The technical communicator is always perfectly situated to be that person. Yeah. And, and I think it's, um, it, it, it's not always noticed by other people. And I think if we wait for other people to invite us, you're never going to get a seat at the table. Like it's not going to happen. Sorry. Sorry, kids. Not going to be a reality. That's not yep. the discipline. Like we're, we're talking about a field that basically, you know, up until recently, fairly recently, people tripped into the field. Like, yeah. how many people have we talked to in the professional world that have like, well, I kind of got sucked into doing the technical writing because <laughs> I knew how to spell. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was the best writer. And so right. that was like the skill set I was able to bring. Yeah. Right, right. Or, you know, I was the engineer who was worried about the end user. So I ended up being the person who was writing the documentation. Right, right yeah. So, and, and now it's, it's great because it's growing up and it's a professional, you know, it's got a lot of, 
meat behind it now. But I think it still has that legacy of people don't understand always. So I think it's up to up to us in the field to do the translation for people to listen. Like Jack, you were open. You put your you put your banner up. Yeah. Right? And you were open to the dialogue and you you worked. I think one of the key things is you you took the time to fully listen, which is another talent, I think, that technical and professional writers have. Yeah. Is they listen. You can tell I come from an engineering background because I ain't rant rant talk. <laughs> <laughs> or she's used to talking to me with the engineering background. <laughs> but- it becomes this thing where all of a sudden you, you take that time to listen to what their issues are, what their problems are, just like you would with a user with, with your right. product, right? I'm taking the time to listen to my, my colleague's research problems and the gap that he needs someone's, you know, expertise or knowledge in. You take that time, you're able to sort of make the case for how you fit into this project. And then all of a sudden that opens up so many other opportunities, um, and now I'm working with people in electrical engineering all of a sudden. And so uh-huh. now I'm having conversations with them and they're saying, okay, well, tell me about this user experience thing. Like, what, how does that relate to engineering? Yeah. And then I'm like, <laughs> okay, like, let me tell you, right? Like, this is the perfect <laughs> opportunity because it becomes this thing where, again, they're always thinking about, okay, well, how can I build this device or how can I make it smaller or how can I blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, have we shown it to anybody yet? And they're like, well, it's not ready. And I'm like, it doesn't have to be ready, right? We can start to already incorporate this into our users. And so even just saying some things that for me, I'm like, well, of course, this is how I would do it. This is how I would tackle this thing. People in other disciplines just aren't thinking like that. That's not their, their sort of shared knowledge. Yeah. And so all of a sudden the engineers were like, we need this guy on our team. And then we end up, we ended up writing a grant together because they saw such value in being like, wow, we can show prototypes to our users throughout the whole process. And that will help drive. And like, once we started going through all this, it was like, yes, absolutely. Everything just started to click and fall into place. Yeah. And all it took was one conversation to explain what I do, what user experience is, and how that can be beneficial to your particular project. And now mm-hmm. all of a sudden that opened up so many other doors. Mm-hmm. So. Do you think, you know, here's a silly question, but do you think just by, because of the position of professional and technical writing that you, you are in user experience, like it's not like a separate thing. It's, that so, I mean, I there's, a, there's a lot more discipline around it, but I think you're like, naturally, you're already in it. You're in your user experience, right? I think that there's a lot of people that would try and make the separation and be like, mm-hmm. well, no, I don't, I don't do that kind of research because yes, there is a huge discipline of its own. UX has its own, you know, entire right. discipline. But right. if you really just break it down to its most basic sense, even just for the most basic traditional technical writer, I'm like, are you thinking about your audience? Are you thinking about how they're going to use your, your writing, your documentation? Mm-hmm. If the answer is yes, and it should be yes, you're doing, you're doing at least at a base level, some user experience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the exciting thing when we talk about UX is that it is, it's that writer being brought in early. Yeah. Yeah. Like what you're talking about is while it's still in that design and that, incubation phase it's as as a technical and professional writer you can be brought in at that phase before it's finished like because a lot of engineers think well wait till it's done and then you can then we'll worry about that like let me finish it first (laughs) but now they're saying wait no it's advantageous if we bring these user people in early right (laughs) these user people (laughs) and income yeah and i can even say you know with with this engineering colleague because now we're also sort of doing our own little tandem thing now too Mm -hmm. um was we're 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 working on creating this this device and we're going to try and get it patented so um you know we're we're super excited but that's also something that's really crazy to me being a a technical communicator that like oh i could have a a patented invention 
but we, we were trying to walk through and he's like, well, I'm going to need to put in a lot of work and time to figure out the size of this thing. And like what it's, what it looks like. He's like, do you think it would be helpful before I like get out my wires and I start to, you know, build this thing. If I just like 3d printed, just like what I think the shape of it's going to be. And I was like, yes. And so I have just this block, this block of plastic that is sort of the proto the first version prototype of our device. Uh -huh. And once he printed it out and I'm looking at it, I was already starting to think, okay, well, users are gonna have, this is too bulky or this is too big or hmm, there's not really a lot of space for our buttons here. Right. And all of a sudden he was like, you just thought of all that from this little purple like block of 3D print that I did today that took me 15 minutes. And I was like, yeah, we could show this to people like today. Uh -huh. start yeah. to get their feedback and he was like you know again mind blown he was like oh my gosh yeah. this could save so much time before I put in all this all these hours and effort into actually crafting something and mm -hmm. building something from scratch well and you want to fail early and fast right you want to find those things sooner rather than later absolutely I always tell my students we want to fail early and honestly I mean, we kind of want to fail often too. Yeah, I, don't I was wanna, just going to say, yeah. I don't want to fail on my first prototype and then not talk to anybody else until the end and be like, we must have ironed out all the kinks the first time around. And I'm like, no, okay. I want immediately, let's start testing that second prototype and then fix those things and just keep going until we get to the end. And then it doesn't stop there. Once we launch whatever it is, our, our hardware, our software, our app, our website, we have to still be doing testing to make sure that we're keeping it up to date and and listening to our users once they're really working with it because it's never it's never finished they're never, never. it's never done it's you never you're gonna have new iterations and it doesn't matter whatever it is definitely not websites websites are never done it's it's never finished because you can always change because people change so our technology yeah. needs to change right our experience in life changes so yeah. it's, it's an ever evolving and expanding and growing. Um, but I like that you have fail, fail often early. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and, and not only like do the people change, but it's their goals, right. And their mm -hmm. objectives. Why, why did I start using your product to begin with? Does that really align with what I'm trying to do with it anymore? Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity for companies or organizations to adapt. I mean, I think the pandemic was a perfect opportunity for so many companies to say, this is not what people want anymore, or they want this other thing. We need to figure out a way that we can do it and do it well. Mm -hmm. And, and there were some organizations that sort of just said, we're going to just keep powering through with what we do. And they, they start to fall behind because they're not really thinking about the change of people's goals or objectives because so many things change for people. And so it should never be a complete product. You can say we're done from the prototyping and we've launched it. You can buy it now, but you should always be making changes, always be making updates. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, because it's never, never finished. Yeah. It's interesting because you know, challenging times bring out interesting results at the back end. Like it's, it's going to be really exciting what happens, you know, on the back side of, of the pandemic because technology, because it, forces you to stop and pay attention to these things and kind of take a step back. Yeah, right? absolutely. And, and look at things different and see, you know, what works and what doesn't work and what are, how has everything changed and how do we meet that and address that? So I think for people in the field and people in research and universities, it's going to be quite exciting. Yes. Because I, I can't help but yeah. think that this has changed our way of thinking in, in some respect. And our, our um, going forward, I think it's going to have a profound impact that people don't realize yet. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. No, I think it's great. I think it's great yeah. because we have to start thinking more into the future than I think we're comfortable with sometimes or that we mm -hmm. want to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm even thinking, and I know that we've, we've talked about it a couple of times, just, just me and the two of you about... Um, the sort of project I'm working on right now with my psychology colleague that started with this keyboard research. And now um, we've built a driving simulator 
Oh, um, we wrote yeah. a grant together and, and built a driving simulator. And we don't have self-driving cars right now. Nobody, nobody does. We can say that, you know, Tesla has some self-driving capabilities, but you still have to pay attention to the, you know, the steering wheel. So we start thinking, okay, well, what does that look like 10 years from now? Right. And how can we start to be on the forefront of research to say, how can we build a better driving experience? How can we prepare our drivers for the future? And right. so I think what companies have started to do here is like, okay, well, how do we make ourselves competitive 10 years from now? Because they weren't really thinking that far ahead. They were sort of just thinking, okay, we're rolling out this one feature, you know, we'll sort of see how it goes. But now you, you better start thinking, okay, once that feature is out, what other possibilities, capabilities do we have to really offer our, our potential users or, or consumers? Right. Yeah. And that's a, I, no, go ahead. That's a high pressure, hard to test kind of environment too, right? Yeah. You can't stop someone in the middle of driving and say, okay, let's evaluate your button choices. <laughs> How do you feel about picking this one or that one, right? Because they're driving. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So you got to start earlier and you have to reach out farther or find new other ways to get at that problem, I think, right? Yeah. And so, you know, sort of the, the inspiration behind it, which was, which I thought was so great. My psychology colleague is thinking about, he, ha he has two, two young daughters and he's thinking about them in the future. Mm -hmm. And he's like, if Tesla is where it's at right now, who, who knows 10 years when they get their permit and, you know, they get their driver's license, what kind of cars are going to be on the road? Mm -hmm. And so he starts to think, what would I want them to have access to? or the knowledge that I could give to them and people like them, that generation. Or we could even That's say, you know, what type of people yeah. call people conveyances are going to be on the road. Yeah. Cause Absolutely. you know, does it have to be a car? <laughs> Doesn't have to be. Right. We, we, we don't, we don't know. About, yeah. Yeah. We've thought about what like autonomous self-driving shuttles could look like. Mm -hmm. What do self-driving Ubers with no drivers right. look like just a car rolls up, picks you up and you go to your destination. Right. <laughs> um, I'm picturing total recall. <laughs> <That's what laughs> hey, yeah. you know, sci-fi oftentimes does become reality. I remember the old but, Star Trek and the, the little communication devices. But it becomes this thing where, where anything is possible and, and mm -hmm. why, why should we limit ourselves to what we have access to now? Right. If we can start to really think about what a user's experience could be rather than what it is right now. Right. And that's the same thing for like, you know, when people are, are in technical and professional communication, why limit yourself to what you're working on right now? Yeah. Right. Look at what other people are getting involved in and where things are happening and get yourself involved, right? Get yourself an invitation. Now in your situation, Somebody, you know, you, you put up your, your banner, you know, you put up your little sign and you advertise, this is me, this is what I do. So it took somebody in psychology to take the initiative to come and seek you out. Luckily you did good SEO and there was language that you could kind of understand, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So you made yourself approachable, but he approached you. You don't necessarily have to wait for that. You don't, and I've, right? and I've been, I've been on reverse, that. Yeah, the reverse would work because as technical and professional communicators, like we know how to read content <laughs> from other people and yeah. try and kind of understand what they're doing. You can go insert yourself in, right? Absolutely, and, and I did that for, for another project. Um, it was actually the grant project I worked on with the engineering people uh -huh. um, because we, we were thinking about a very um, particular population um, that has some medical sort of background to it, but engineering guy doesn't have a background in, in medicine. I don't have a background in medicine. And so we start coming up with their ideas and we're like, cool, we could test users like X, Y, and Z. And then I just sort of had to be like, well, if our users have this sort of medical condition, I don't really know how that affects their experience mm -hmm. with this particular product. So I said, we need a medical person on the yeah. team. Yeah. Because we could have just said, eh, we'll just make some assumptions. We'll just say everybody, you know, is fine. Everything's fine, but it's not the case. And so right. again, I have to advocate for who those potential end users are, right. but I don't have the expertise to truly 
advocate for them the way that they need. So I said, okay, let me look at my resources. Let me see. Again, I don't know a lot about this medical field, but I read a couple of things, you know, I, I can pick out some key words. And so I start to do a very similar thing that my psychology colleague did to find me. I said, okay, let me start look at some of the faculty web pages. Well, there's a lot of people in the school of nursing that looks like they haven't completed their profile. So that's not going to help me. So I'm like, okay. And I just kind of went through the list uh -huh. trying to find people that maybe came from a degree that sounded sort of similar or something like that. Or maybe I could find on like Google Scholar, a couple of their articles they published. And I, I sort of went through and did this research like a good, you know, a good, you know, technical communicator would. And I sort of sent out an email to three people that I sort of identified, like you could be potentially, you know, the perfect partner here. Mm -hmm. And I have to, I crafted my, my email to sort of explain what the project was. And not only that, but sort of explain what value I think they can add to our project. Yeah. The value they can add to the conversation. And sure enough, I sent out those three emails. One out of those three people was the exact person I was looking for. We have our meeting, we chat about things. And then all of a sudden it's, it was a match made in heaven. It was perfect. So there are opportunities for you to do a little, do a little digging, do a little research and say, I want to do a project on blank. I, I'm really passionate about it. I think it'd be really great, but I understand my own limitations. I'm going to do my job and make sure that we can advocate for the right people, that end user. And I'm going to find someone who can and bring right. them in, bring them into the project. And I think you brought up a really good point too, as you explained to those three people, as you were sending out an email, why them? Yeah. Yeah. And what value they would bring, you know, from your, because you haven't talked to them yet, but you have a limited understanding of what potential value they could bring, but you're helping them translate. I'm in the medical field. Why do I want to talk to an engineer and a technical <laughs> writer? Like, right. Really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and, and they're on a completely different campus. So they, they don't know what our degrees are, what we're doing over here. Yeah. They're and, like interfacing with organic uh, organisms. Like what right, is yeah, right. well, I'm in the Petri dish and like, <laughs> what? Right. right. And my engineering colleague is there, you know, putting things, uh, wires into his breadboard and I'm over here <laughs> looking at websites and apps and things like that. Right. right. Why should I talk to you? Yeah. And, how do these, th how does this come together to make ambrosia? Like, <laughs> right, right. And, and what was actually really great was that one of the other people I had emailed forwarded that email over to the person who ended up being the, the one that agreed. Cause they were like, I don't do exactly what you're explaining, but I know someone who does. And it just happened to be the same person. So um, it was great. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think explaining the, that person's value or what you see sort of the value added to your project is so huge because more often than not, we're always being asked to do something or being pulled in so many different directions. And I would want to, if, you, if you're asking me to be on your project, I want to really know how do I fit? How do I fit in? Mm -hmm. And is it just because you need my name on there or you need to see like my little department on there? Like, oh, you just needed someone from the school of nursing or something on here. Right. And it's like, no, I, I see a particular value in your expertise here is sort of how you, your puzzle piece, your puzzle piece of expertise fits into the larger puzzle of what we're trying to do here. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really what sold it and really brings value. If someone sent me an email and said, you know, Jack, this is how I think your expertise in user experience can be a benefit to our project. I would say, I'm all ears. Tell me more. Let's set up a meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just said, um, you want to join this thing? And I look at that <laughs> title of your project and I'm like, don't really see how a UX person fits in here. So I might say no mm -hmm. without even really having that opportunity to learn more or see what I could have done or the value I could have added. Mm -hmm. It's funny. We all do that. And we don't think about that often enough when we send an email to somebody else trying to get them involved. Yeah. We all, we all have that reaction when somebody sends something to us. Because yeah. more often than not, you just assume that whoever is sending you that invite has something to gain yeah. from you. And maybe out of the goodness of your heart, you just agree and you're like, yeah, I'll help you out. But at the same time, I mean, there should be some benefit for both parties. And I think that being explicit in what that benefit is, 
obviously sets a great tone for sort of the, the partnership that you're about to create, but I think really helps people make that decision on whether or not that's something they want to be a part of. Well, and it, 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 um, they don't have to work at trying to figure that out. It's like you're, you're helping them understand what's in it for me. Yeah. It's a human nature thing, really. Don't make them work hard to figure out why you want them. Because <laughs> they're already working hard on what they're doing, right? Yeah. You know, and, and we as individuals, it's a human nature. We want to know what's in it for me. Why does this matter to me? And it's not a self-centered or ego focused thing. It's just the nature of who we are as a species. Yeah. So we have to understand what is the benefit because with everything in life, every person at every second is doing a cost benefit analysis. Absolutely. Like it's going to cost me something to talk to you. What's my benefit? Right. And that's just natural. So as, as technical and professional communicators, we don't need to have them understand where we add value. We know where we add value. We need to un- explain to them how our value benefits them. Right. Absolutely. So how their expertise and their abilities would benefit this, how it would benefit them first. Right. Yep. That's kind of Absolutely. what you were doing is you were saying, there, here's what's in it for you. Yeah. And let me explain more again about the project. <laughs> <laughs> well, because, because, and, and, and you know, you know, you mentioned, you know, like, let's say they, they were, they're working with their, their Petri dishes or something like that. And it was reverse and they came to me and they mm-hmm. said, you know, Hey Jack, you want to come to my lab? Here's the title of my paper, Petri dish 101, <laughs> you know? I'm going to look at that and say, well, I've never worked with Petri dishes before. So I think you're asking the wrong person. Right. But if you explain sort of, oh, well, there's a gap here and we're really trying to figure out, you know, we're building the the next great Petri dish design. And we really think that if we talk to users and had your expertise, we could craft a better Petri dish. I'd all of a sudden start to say, I know exactly how I can help you. I'm already starting to maybe think of some ideas. So then when we do have our first meeting, our first conversation, I'm like, I've already started to think about how I can fit in here. So just even, it doesn't have to be a lot, just a little bit of how I can fit into this project, the benefit I can sort of gain from it. It's all it takes to get the conversation started. In a language that they understand. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You're a great collaborator. It seems like you get all, you like to, talk and figure out things and, and, and learn other, the other languages of the other groups. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think it's one of those things too, because TechCom, because UX is very much integrated in almost any discipline, is that I don't have a hard time finding how I may be able to fit into one of these other things. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. Oh yeah, of course. Engineering, you probably don't want to talk to users. I can see that, right? psychology, we want to figure out how can we make a product better or something like that. Cool. Let's, let's jump in there. Right. I, I can easily find the way to get in there. Um, even with a, a medical person, you know, Hey, okay. Um, we have this documentation for, you know, this new product we're working on. And I'm like, okay, we're going to need a technical writer to come in there. Right. And try and explain this to, to the average lay person. And so I think it's really a great field to be in being a technical communicator and again, like we sort of mentioned at the beginning, even if you're just doing a hint of user experience, right, you're almost valuable to any possible team or pro- project or industry or field or whatever, as long as you, you know, want to put in the time or if it's of interest to you. And for me, I think I am lucky that I am very much inter- interested in, in everything and sort of uh, learning a little bit about, about things. But if there's something that you're like, wow, I really wish I could have worked on this cool thing in biology or, or electrical engineering or something like that, I think technical communicators go for it. There's nothing that says that you shouldn't try to have the, uh, that first conversation and reach out. Yeah. I, think people, I think people would welcome the skill set. Absolutely. And I think, I think what it is, is some of these other fixed fields. I think that's the beauty. One of the beauties of, of, uh, of technical and professional communications is it's not a fixed, you know, discipline. It it bridge it touches everything in everyone's life. I mean, it really does. It it crosses all boundaries. So it's limitless. So 
I think rather than waiting for an invitation for a seat at the table, I think the ownership becomes for the technical and professional communicator to seek out those opportunities. Now, sometimes things are going to be dropped on your lap or somebody's going to knock on your door, yeah. right? But that's not always the case. And I think it's what your interest, just look at what's going on and find out something that's interesting and help them understand how you would benefit that project. Yeah, in order I mean, to get that's, a seat. How, that's how the driving simulator project came to be. It was just something where my colleague said, we worked together on this one thing. You know, I kind of had this idea. He never did any driving research either, but it was something that he was interested in. He's like, you want to sort of tackle this journey together? And I was like, that would be so cool to, to find out the user experience of driving a self-driving car. So I said, mm -hmm. let's do it. Let's go for it. There was nothing that was stopping us from, from pursuing right. that because we could tackle it from the psychological perspective on how people feel, the trust they have for a self-driving car. And I could start to think about how do we design a better interface or the, the takeover when a, you know, the, the self-driving car says, hey, it's getting a little dangerous out there. I'm going to give you control again. Like, what does that takeover request look like? You know, there's so right. much design that goes into that too. And I was like, I'm fascinated by that. Let's just go for it. I get, let's get out of our comfort zone and try something new. Yeah. So that seems too a great way for practitioners who are trying to transition to a different or into the field, or they're mm -hmm. trying to transition from like one mechanical engineering or whatever into API docs or into medical writing. It seems like a good way they can find either volunteer projects and say, hey, you know, you're not doing particularly well with your communication. I can help with that. And you get a portfolio piece and you get new people that you're working with had no idea that they even needed you. Yeah, absolutely. And that was actually one of the benefits of teaming up with the engineering people and tackling. It was a, it was a huge grant. Unfortunately, we didn't win, but um, you know, there was a giant grant from the department of transportation. They put out this huge call um, for inclusive design. And all of a sudden that was a light bulb in my head. Cause I was like, okay, I can already see the benefit of some user yeah. experience here. Um, but what was great was there was opportunities for just individuals to sort of be like a free agent, like in, in sports, sort of just put their name out there and say, I'm interested in this grant. I don't have a team. Here's my skill set. I'm available if you need me. Neat. And people oh, got, yeah. and people got picked up onto teams. Because, yeah. oh, we needed a programmer over here. Oh, we needed a grant writer over here. So there are opportunities out there where right. the technical writers can say, you know what? Let me see kind of what's going on out there. Are there opportunities for me to just sort of throw my name in the free agent pool and see if I get picked up? I mean. Yeah. Well, it's kind of, you like, like what you did with your website. You, put, you did your faculty website and you put up your keywords. So it's kind of like that. It's like you can throw yourself out there and. And, you know, just find a field that you're interested in and a project that you're interested in. And that's a great way to bridge yourself into a new discipline. Yeah. And it's, I don't, I don't know that I would necessarily tell somebody, you know, you're, you're, um, you need help. Like, I, I, I don't know that I would say like, and I would keep it positive. Like never say oh, yeah, your documentation yeah. sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, to win friends and influence people don't tell them the baby is ugly <laughs> okay, yeah, absolutely and that's and that's and no but it, it, it's it's true and, and liz you know the people that are trying to maybe jump to another field that is is still very much in their skill set and their wheelhouse but maybe they don't have that portfolio piece or they don't have that little extra line on the resume that could really help them transition to engineering writing or like some, you know, UX writing or medical writing or something like that. There could be opportunities out there where there are projects that are looking for writers um, that don't know that they need you, right? They don't know what they don't know. And all of a sudden you sort of join the free agency pool here, you get picked up onto a team. It's your opportunity to show your value and your worth and who knows what opportunities that then spawns after that. Mm -hmm. Why'd you mute yourself? Liz? You did lose. I don't know. <laughs> That's when it's exciting and fun, right? When there's opportunity and you don't know that it's there until you've had that discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Neat. Yeah. I love that. Cool. 
And I think it's um, I, I think it's funny, like for the for the person in the school of psychology, thank goodness he found you, yeah, so, so that you could translate. For yeah, him. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's and now it's become a two year long partnership, and and yeah. we we see it going. We're already thinking when we finish this first driver simulator study, we're like, here's the next one we're gonna do. We're like, we're already thinking two, three, four years down the line now, and now it's become. Right an incredible collaborative relationship. So I'm so thankful that he reached out and, you know, me reaching out to people in engineering and people in the school of nursing, you know, we had so many meetings, even though we didn't win that grant, we already started thinking when, whenever they send another grant project that's similar to this, we've already got the team assembled. We already sort of know what our strengths are and what we can sort of bring to the table. So. Right. And you right. don't know what other projects you're, you're all going to get involved with because yeah. of that relationship right you might be pulled into something else yeah. and that was the other that's another cool thing about you know when we talk about strategies for getting an invitation right so I think we've discussed several of them but there's the the um there's the it's always kind of paying for itself in perpetual motion when you get involved and you get outside of your comfort zone and you get involved with other disciplines and other groups and you start being that translator between worlds, yeah. all of a sudden you're pulled in. You're not asking to be invited. You're pulled in. Yeah. And Absolutely. you're getting emails from these upstart people in, in, in the school of psychology or these people over in biology. And yeah. you're saying, hmm, well, really cool. do you know where I add value? <laughs> Right, because all of a sudden, who knows, this one research project spawns a couple conference presentations, and then who knows yeah. who's in the audience that wants to collaborate on something, even in other universities or something, and it's just yeah. the snowball effect, the possibilities yeah. are, are truly endless, you never know what that may spawn after that, but it yeah. is just, just taking that leap to say, hey, I'm interested in this thing, I've never done it before, let me figure out who I can talk to, to really make this happen something that I'm mm -hmm. passionate about. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's been great. And we are way past time. Like I just, are I'm we? looking at the, I'm like, whoa, wait. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. We, oh, That's amazing. Well, we get to talking. I was good. I was just going to say so the, the biggest strategy to getting an invitation to the seat of the table is to invite yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But not, but, but don't show up empty handed. Right. You oh, got to right. bring, you know, explain the value that that you add or that they may add to your project so you know bring bring some appetizers or but you, you got to bring a dish <laughs> <laughs> you got to bring an appetizing dish for that group right absolutely yep <laughs> so know the group you don't take steak to a vegan barbecue exactly. <laughs> so know the group take the appropriate dish and you'll <laughs> you'll be welcomed in <laughs> with open arms <laughs> with open arms Jack, it is just such a pleasure to talk to you. It, it is. really is. And I am so thrilled that you took time out of your schedule to come and be with us here in room 42. And I hope we can have you back again. Yeah, I'm very I much. Do.